My first theme is the world of Jesus, and it'll have four segments. But remember from Matrix that Matrix loves questions. So here's the questions, the controlling generative questions for this entire first theme. Before Jesus ever existed, and even if he had never existed, there already was in the first century Mediterranean world a human being, now definitely a human being, whose titles were divine, son of God, God incarnate, God from God, Lord, Redeemer, Liberator, Savior of the world. Those, as no doubt you know, were the titles of Caesar the Augustus, Caesar the one to be worshipped. It's Sebastus in Greek, Augustus in Latin means the one to be worshipped. Now, why were those titles given to Caesar? First question. And second question, what happens when titles like those, the titles of Roman imperial theology, are taken from the emperor who lives on the Palatine Hill in Rome and given to a Jewish peasant who lives on the Nazareth Ridge in Galilee of all places? Is it some kind of a joke? And did the Romans have no sense of humor? Was that the whole problem? The Romans didn't get it was a joke. Or did they get it precisely right that it was high treason? So our question, the generative question really almost, not just for this, but for the whole four themes. What happens when the titles of Roman imperial theology are taken from the imperial Rome and given to Jesus? What's the change? Somebody might have said to Paul, what do you mean, savior of the world? We already got one. Who needs a second one? So, let me begin the first of my four segments. Watch time and place always. Here's what's going on. We're trying to understand what did Caesar do to get the title of Augustus and all those other titles. Rome had invented a marvelous system for avoiding tyranny. Let's have no kings. We'll have two consuls. High aristocrats in for a year, then they're both out. And it worked great. It worked magnificently until something happened. Rome discovered, Rome discovered you could have a republic. They invented it. You could have a republic or you could have an empire. But you couldn't have both at the same time for long. Rome learned what other republics have not yet learned, that you could have empire or republic, but not both at the same time for long. What happened was Rome broke apart into civil war. Its worst nightmare, the consuls, the two consuls became warlords with battle-hardened legions on both sides. I mean, imagine our civil war going on for 20 years? And almost the whole Mediterranean world going down with it, because most of these wars took place in Greece. It's kind of, let's ruin Greece and spare Italy. So you can go through the various rounds, Caesar against Pompey. Second round, the, the, the assassins of Caesar against the defenders of Caesar. And finally, finally, the date, the 2nd of September, 31 BCE, time, the place, Cape Axiom on the northwest corner of Greece. The last round in the civil wars. On one side, Anthony, backed by the wealth and power of Egypt, Cleopatra's Egypt. On the other side, Octavian. He wasn't yet Augustus. In effect, he'd be Augustus by evening. They're off Cape Axiom. All that long, hot summer, the fleet of Antony and Cleopatra is securely ensconced or definitively trapped, depending upon your viewpoint, inside the Ambracian Gulf. Outside in the Ionian Sea is the fleet of Octavian and his great, great Admiral Agrippa. Maybe the first Roman who really learned, who really understood that naval warfare was not land warfare on rafts. 
That's the biggest thing Octavian had going for him, Agrippa. They're waiting. Eventually, that magnificent September morning, Antony and Cleopatra's fleet comes out to the Straits of Cape Axiom. They've been sapped all summer by despair, by disease. They're surrounded by wetlands, and with wetlands you get mosquitoes, and with mosquitoes you get malaria. Half their ships have no roars. They're, they're left behind. They come out, probably not for fight, but for flight. And of course, Agrippa and Octavian are waiting for them. They're waiting for the wind to shift from straight west to northwest. And then as it shifts and the fleet starts to engage, Cleopatra's fleet, her squadron, her battle squadron, takes off directly through the, the opening, and Anthony joins it, and they flee to Egypt. They give up. They desert their, their followers. And Octavian can't really believe it. He spends the night on his ship, we're told. It's over? Yeah, it's over. By the end of the evening, Antony and Cleopatra fled to Egypt and double suicide. Octavian is master of the world. And at that spot of Axiom, the goddess Apollo, who, who is the father, the alleged father, shall we say, of, of Augustus, appears above his ship and says to him, Savior of the world, now conquer at sea. The land is already yours. Savior of the world. And then we know what it means. He has saved the Roman world from absolutely destructive civil war. And Julius Caesar <coughs> appears to him and says, you are of my blood. This proves it. So we're beginning to see victory. It's about victory. Everything would be totally different if it was even a draw. And Octavian then does something brilliant. Because Antony has left their troops behind and his land army is still strong. Octavian pays off not only his own veterans, his own troops, but he pays off, if you're a cynic you could say, buys off the beaten troops. He gives them the same pay. He has minted certain coins. They've been described as the most magnificent coins ever minted in the Roman Empire. Silver denarii. Denarius is a day laborer's pay. They're beautiful coins, and they're very simple. There's six of them. On three of them, there's the head of Augustus on one side and a goddess. A goddess, a full-bodied goddess on the other. And on the other three, you have the head of a goddess on one side, and then the body, the full body of Octavian Augustus on the other. It's like, well, we're, we're all divine here, so who cares whether it's you're on the front or the back of the coin? We're all divine. So you're getting a message from the coinage as a whole. There's only one expression on the coins. All it says is Caesar DVF in Latin. Caesar, son of God. Very simple. But the three goddesses are important. The first goddess, the most important one, is Pax, peace. So when Caesar addresses the troops before the battle, always shown like this with the right hand raised in salutation and address, he tells them, you're fighting for peace. You're going to war to obtain peace. And during, during the battle, he's protected by the goddess Venus, Aphrodite in Greek, Venus in Latin, who is the ancestral goddess of his clan. She protects them. You can usually see her, she's toying with the, with the arms of Mars, who is her consort. She's, as it were, making love, not war. And then finally, the most important of the three goddesses, Victoria, victory. She's always shown with wings, because she's like a grace sent by the gods to wherever they want. And now, of course, they're sending her regularly to Rome. She appears often with the world. She's giving the world to Augustus. And he appears with his foot on the world, on the globe. So these are the coins that he has made to pay off his troops. Now you're starting to get a message, a clear message. And you can see it in the monument that he built at Axiom. He built a monument. And he built it on his own tent site. So the place where he slept the night before, 
becomes sacred ground. So you're beginning to see that Roman imperial theology is incarnate in Caesar. This, these titles are about incarnate programs, embodied processes. On this monument, he put 30 of the, the fighting rams, the big bronze rams at the front of the warships of Antony and Cleopatra. Put them as spoils all along there. So the biggest is about two tons of cast bronze. The rams are there, the rams that would be on the prows of their ships as they charged into the enemy. Then above that is an inscription. And the inscription is there by probably at the latest by 29 or 27 BCE. And it's the best, most succinct and earliest summary of Roman imperial theology. I'll summarize it. It's dedicated, first of all, to Mars and Neptune, the war god and the sea god. It's a naval battle. So religion comes first. It thanks them for the war that was conducted in this place of Cabaxium. And it thanks them because they gave them victory in this war. And from this victory came peace on land and sea. And there we begin to see clearly, succinctly, in magnificent, big, tall Latin letters. And you know, if the people around couldn't understand Latin, that's part of the point. They looked at this, hmm, we don't understand, and Rome would say, we will explain it to you. Religion, war, victory, peace. The Roman mantra, the Roman program, and the program of every empire that has ever existed in the history of the world. How do you get peace? You get it through victory. And Octavian would have said, we didn't invent this, we just got particularly good at doing it. They would have said, there is no other way of getting peace. You get peace after you pacify, after you pacify rebellion. So we're beginning to see immediately the incarnate program. And I want to insist on that word incarnate. The title, the first title given to Caesar, none of those ones I've just mentioned, God, divine, we might think they're the most important ones. The first title is always imperator. We translate it as emperor. It means victor. After a successful battle, when the, when the general addressed the troops, you can imagine the troops as were beating with their swords on their shields, imperator, imperator, imperator. It doesn't, doesn't mean emperor, it means victor. And when it became the first title, and it's the first one in every inscription, imp, I-M-P, abbreviated, you're making the claim world conqueror. It became the title of Caesar, and nobody else got it except somebody who was part of his imperial family. You're making the claim, the only way you ever get peace is through victory. You only get peace through victory. And the question we're going to be asking as we go through these themes is, is there another way? Is there any other way? Are, are these claims right? You can only get peace through victory. Is there another way?